If you have an interest in horses and love learning more about horses, the horse industry, teaching, or even managing your own horse business, then you're in the right place. We would love you to join us on our mission, which is to improve the lives of horses around the world through the education of riders, handlers, and trainers. So get comfortable, listen in, and enjoy. This is another of our popular Listener's Choice interviews, which we're playing over the weekend. We've chosen the most popular interviews for you to select the Listener's Choice winner. If you're not sure how the Listener's Choice competition works, have a look at horsechats.com slash choice for the rules and the leaderboard. Today's chat's been brought to you by International Horse College. We have a mission to improve the welfare of horses throughout the world through the safe education of riders, handlers and trainers, and that's what these chats are all about. Registered Training Organisation 31352. Today on Horse Chats, we've got a regular guest coming back, Wendy Murdoch. Now, Wendy was a guest before on number 453, and she talked about the Sure Fit Equine Stability Program. Wendy is quite passionate about horses, but she also is quite a student. She studies in other areas, brings them into the horse world, and we learn lots from her. Anyway, how are you, Wendy? I'm good, thanks. How are you? Oh, really good, Wendy. Now, we're going to talk about 10 quick tips to improve your riding. Yep. And I know that, you know, some of the people that you've studied with are just riding fanatics and, and, you know, improving your riding fitness or position. So I'm sure we're going to learn a lot from you. But any particular reason, do you see there's a gap here? You know, I mean, you obviously go out and you speak internationally and you teach to a lot of people, but do you find there's a gap here in this area that you're going to teach us today that people could learn more? Well, when I when I started out, I swore I was never going to work with people. Uh, and now, <laughs> well, horses are easier I sometimes, know like, yes. <laughs> you know, I was always going to work with the horses. Yeah. But what I realized was that for I could work with one horse and, and help that horse, and then I would have to put that rider back on. Mm. But if I helped one rider, I changed every horse they sat on. Yes. So it, that, the numbers just worked out that it made way more sense for me to wind up teaching the riders and improving the riders because – they're going to help every horse they sit on. Mm -hmm. And no matter what, you know, like I, I don't know if you've ever interviewed Gerd Huishman, um, but I met him in January and I watched him teaching and we had long discussions. And the bottom line was, you know, in order for the horses to do what he wants them to do, to be ridden classically, the rider has to know about their body and how it functions to do it. Mm -hmm. That simply telling a rider what to do isn't going to work because if you don't know where your body parts are and how to use them, you can't do what they tell you. Okay. And so if we really want to make a change to the horses, we've got to educate the riders. And we have to teach them about their own body, how their body functions, how that body unifies with the horse's body. Because in the end, gravity doesn't care what saddle you're in, what type mm -hmm. of horse you're sitting on, yeah. what discipline you're doing. You know, gravity is the law. Yeah. And we have to figure out how to align and organize our body and gravity to be the most efficient in the best balance for that horse so that we're not interfering with his movement and we can guide him into the movements that we want him to do. And so that's really, that's where I wound up, you know, like, I've um, been doing this for 30 years now. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right. We'll start with the first one. And the first one is flatten your lower back. Can you talk in a little bit more detail about that one? Right. So, so typically riders are taught to sit up straight. And the problem with that position and the way it's taught today is that the rider hollows the lower back and pitches the pelvis so that the seat bones are pointing behind them. And then they have to do all kinds of things to try and sit up straight because they've, if, if they've spilt the bowl. So if you think about carrying a bowl of water, right, mm -hmm. if you tilt the bowl forward, the water's going to spill out. If you tilt the bowl back, the water's going to spill out the back. But if you have the bowl level, the water's going to stay in it. So if we think of our pelvis like a like a bowl, we have to align it in such a way that the water's going to stay in. And to do that, we need to flatten the lower back. Now, this does not mean that we're taking the natural curves out of the spine. It actually means what we're doing is putting our body in a, in a seated posture, in other words. When we stand, the lower back goes into what's called lordosis, a little more forward curve. And that's because we're standing. And that's totally appropriate for standing. 
And when that happens, there's a ligament called the iliofemoral ligament. Ilio is pelvis, uh, femoral is femur. So the ligament goes from the pelvis to the femur. Ligaments only work in position. In other words, they're bone-to-bone connections, and they don't have really any muscle fibers, so they don't contract on their own. But when the skeleton's in a certain position, it engages that ligament. When you stand, the iliofemoral ligament comes under tension because of this slight increase in lordosis in the lower back, and that's what allows you to stand easily. So as that ligament tightens, it pulls the femur into the socket and tightens the hip which is a good thing if you want to stand. But when you want to ride a horse, that tension in the iliofemoral ligament that is putting the, or sorry, that, well, tension is a tension in the iliofemoral ligament, which is helping the hip stay stable in the socket, is limiting to us as riders because the most important joint in riding is the hip joint and it needs to be free. Mm -hmm. So when we sit, if we lengthen the lower back, then that iliofemoral ligament is no longer under tension and it free, allows the hip joint to become free. If we have a lot of habits about tensing the hips, we've got to address that, and that's one of the other fixes. But in this case, flattening the lower back means that we want the pelvis organized so that the widest part of the seat bones are pointing downward and the lower back is flat, not hollow. Mm-hmm. And that's going to allow that ligament to come to be released and no longer be under the tension that's caused when you hollow. Yeah, Which means yeah. most people, when I put them in this position, feel slumpy. They're like, are you kidding? And I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because yeah. We're, we, we've been yelled at to sit up, sit up. But there's a reason why we've been yelled at to sit up. And that's going to come up in, in, as we go down the list. So this one is. Really simple if you're, you know, if you're listening to this program, it's really easy. If you're sitting on a chair, just stick your hand underneath your seat bone, Mm -hmm. right? And just do one hand because if you do both, you get stuck. And then very slowly hollow the lower back and feel how the seat bone rolls off your hand and the seat bone's pointing back to the back of the chair. Mm -hmm. And then start to change the position of the pelvis so that the seat bone starts to point forward. So you let the top of the pelvis come back and the seat bone going to point forward and you'll feel that seat bone roll over your hand. Play with that a little bit, making each time smaller and smaller and look for the widest part of the seat bone on your hand. And that's what we're talking about. If you place your, your the back of your hand now on your lower back, you're going to feel that it's flat. And that's the other place that you can put a hand is the, flat, the back of the hand on the lower back. And then again, play with the position of the seat bone and look for the place where the back's flat. And that's pretty much going to be when that seat bone's pointing straight down. Mm, mm. Good exercise. I just did it while I'm talking to you. And yes, you can definitely feel it. Definitely. Great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wendy, I love it when I ask you a question. It's like you give me so much information and it's it's just, you know, sometimes you get podcasts, you just got to go back and listen to again and again. For sure, I'll be listening to this one. Um, even just, on, we've only talked about one point, but you know, I can see that it's something that we need to um, to go back and listen to. And I know the depth of knowledge that you have that you bring into the horse industry. So, you know, I want to thank you for that. It's It's been a lifetime of study for you to gather that sort of knowledge. The next one we're going to talk about is to locate your hip joints. And I'm ready now. I'm ready to do another exercise if, you, if you're going <laughs> to do any. <laughs> Great. So there's a couple of things that I teach at everywhere I go. And people always say, well, that's just here. And quite frankly, it's everywhere I go around the planet, around the world. Mm -hmm. I teach the same thing because even though everybody speaks a different language, we all have a body and we all have a body that's basically the same and functions in a very similar way. So locating hip joints is one of those things that 99% of my students don't really think about where their hip joints are. And the reason is, is because we culturally think of our hips as the top of our pelvis, where our belt sits. So when I ask people, you know, point to your hip joints from the front of your body, meaning the way your face is pointing, they'll uh, 99% of them will point somewhere to some part of the pelvis. But the pelvis is not a joint. And so when I'm talking about hip joints, I'm talking about the biggest joint in the body, and it's the most important joint in riding. And it's about a two-inch, I don't know how many centimeters that is, but it's a two-inch ball in in a very deep socket. Now, on my horse trailer, I have about a two-inch ball. So when you think that the size of your hip joint is the size of your horse trailer hip, it's pretty big. And it's really important because that's where your leg attaches to your body. So that's actually one of the ways to find it is to think about where is the top of your leg 
as opposed to where is your pelvis. So since the hip joint's the largest joint in the body and it's the closest joint to the horse, it's the most important joint in riding because if there's any tension in the hip joint, it's going to affect your contact. Now, people are surprised when I talk about this because they think of contact as coming from your hands. But if you have tension in your hips, you will have tension in your hands unless you have to like do something to change that. In other words, if your hips are soft, you're going to have a soft contact. But if your hips are stiff, you're going to have to try and make a soft contact instead of just have one. Mm -hmm. And that's because the minute the hips are sticky, it interferes with the horse's hind leg movement and it tenses your shoulders. So to find your hip joint, here's the really simple way to do it. It's easier to do it standing up. So if you stand up and you point one toe so that the knee is bent, take your hand and slide it into the crease of your pants that you created by pointing your toe and slide your hand in. And as you're doing that, very slowly move your knee a little bit to the left and then a little bit to the right. And when you move the knee, make sure that you're not moving the pelvis, that you're just thinking of moving the leg because you're looking for the place where the leg is connecting to the body. So you're looking for that place where you can feel joint movement, not just simply move, random movement. And when I talk about joint movement, you're like, if I ask somebody, you know, locate your elbow joint, everybody knows where that is. It's something we're much more conscious of. So when you think about the type of movement you feel in your elbow, it's a different style of joint, but again, it's joint movement. So that's what you're looking for as you follow along the crease and you slowly move your knee a little bit left and right. And what's surprising to most people is how far toward midline this really is. In other words, we tend to think of our hips as being rather wide or rather far out on the body, but they're actually quite close together and they're above the seat bones. So if you had your hand underneath your seat bone and you located where that was, the hip joint is going to be above that. So if you're sitting again, you can find your seat bone, slide your hand out, and then follow the crease of your pants. And just move your knee a little bit to the left and right and look for where that joint movement is. Now, obviously, you can't touch the joint. That's like there's tissue in the way, right? But we can easily identify joint movement. And if you're not sure, just slide your hand out a little bit or put it up on the pelvis and move the knee again. And you're going to quickly feel the difference between the moving in the hip joint or just sort of movement that's because of what you're doing. That makes sense? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It does. And I've definitely got to go back and do that again. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, you know, this is like if I could only teach riders two things, it would be flatten the lower back and locate your hips. And your horse is going to thank you. Your horse is going to move differently. Mm -hmm. And if you're not sure, I always tell my students to go back and forth between the old place and the new place. So if you're not sure, go to your old place and let your horse vote and then look for your new place and let your horse vote. And 99% of the time, the horse is going to show you which one he likes better. And most 99% of that time, it's going to be where the seat bones are down and the hip joint is free. Mm -hmm. And they'll, they'll let their necks down, they'll lift their backs, they'll swing their hind leg more freely underneath. But it kind of flies in the face of this posture that we think we're supposed to have on the horse. Because most of the time when people do this, they feel slumpy. That's because they've been trying so hard to be in this correct posture. Yes. So, you know, give yourself a break and kind of like, you know, don't worry how it looks and let your horse vote. Let him tell you what he thinks. Mm -hmm. If you're an equestrian coach or a horse riding instructor, or even if you aspire to be one, have a look at the free video series for horse riding instructors on the Horse Chats website. Go there now. Have a look. Horsechats.com. The next one, point number three, find your first rib. Yeah, so so I love teaching the people this one because so many people have problems with their shoulders, right? And they're trying to sit up and they're trying to like get their shoulders back and everything. But what we have to realize is that the shoulders rest on something. And what they rest on is the rib cage. And so when we understand where our ribs are, well, then we can find the place where our shoulders can rest so they're not tense. And so the first rib, like I tell people, like point to your first rib. And I've literally had people pointing to just about where their bra line is. And then I say point to the last rib. And everybody knows, oh, the last rib, it's somewhere down there, you know, where my waist is, right? Well, your first rib is actually way up at the base of your neck. 
And there's three ribs that the collarbone crosses, the first, second, and third rib. And the shoulder blade is resting on the back of these ribs. And it's actually resting on more than just the first three. But the first rib is way high up because that's the base of the neck. So the really simple way to find that is to just take your index finger gently and go from behind your ear and slide your hand down to the base of the neck where you, um, you know, kind of feel that it's starting to widen out. And then shrug your shoulder and you're going to feel like a groove, like you've made a little hollow. And then just put your index finger in that hollow. It's between the shoulder blade and the collarbone. So the shoulder blade and the collarbone make a sideways V, right? Not a vertical V, but think of taking a V and putting it on its side. And so you've made this little hollow inside this sideways V. And now let your shoulder down and gently, don't push too hard, because if you push hard, you won't feel anything. But gently press down and, and look for something firm, something hard. And that's where your first rib is. It's way up there at the base of the neck. So, you know, so many people point somewhere on their chest or at their bra line, but really the first rib is right here at the base of the neck, and it's the most ring-like uh, of them all. It, it actually, you know, it's the most collar-like, even though we call it collarbones. I don't know why we call collarbones collarbones, because <laughs> this one is the most, you know, I know it's like, I don't know. <laughs> it's the most ring-like of all the ribs. Uh-huh. And if you're not, you know, the beauty of Google is you can go on Google and you'll Google a skeleton and look where the first rib is and then start thinking about where that is in you. That first rib is going to curve around to your sternum. So once you think you've found it, just slide your finger around. You're going to go over the top of the collarbone as it also connects to the top of the sternum. And that first rib is underneath that attachment of the collarbone. If you go around the back, it's really high up. It's where that big bump is at the back of your neck, right? So it's way up there. And it's these upper ribs that we really need to have to kind of get friendly with. We have to figure out where they are and that we have them because it's those upper ribs that are really going to help us sit up, expand the chest, and have the shoulders in the correct position. So just the, the big caution is not to push too hard. So many people go, well, I can't feel it because they're like poking themselves really hard. Yeah. So you got to go gently or, or go to your friend and do this on your friend because you wouldn't poke your friend hard, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. They can have somebody help you with that one. I actually cheated a bit with that one and I, I Googled the first rib as well. So, you know, I was sort of trying to follow yeah. it. And I thought, no, I'm just going to have a look at a, a diagram here. So. Podcasts are great, but I think in this one, you know, if you get the opportunity to just jump online and, you know, Google a skeleton, I think that one will help. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's not cheap. It's like use your resources. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. And I'm just thinking you've got to move your rib cage, not your shoulders, because you've obviously got to find your first rib, then that goes on to the next one. Yeah. Mm. So, so when most people think of shoulders back, what they do is they pull the shoulders back right? Yes. Well, as you do that, you're using a lot of muscle and you can feel the tension between your shoulder blades at the back of your neck. But more importantly, when you've done that, what direction does your elbow move when you pull your shoulders back? I suppose backwards. Right. So we've now pulled on the horse, Mm. but we don't Mm. want to pull on the horse, Yep. right? So this is the thing. It's like they tell you, pull your shoulders back, but don't pull. Well, that's really confusing, right? And it's really a mixed message. So now we've got to keep my shoulders back, but I got to let my arm go forward. But the action of pulling them back has pulled my arm back. I've pulled my horse. He's not happy with my contact. Mm-hmm. It's different. I hollow my back to do this. You know, it's like this self defeating process. And it's like, wait, we got to make it way easier. We got to make it way easier because riding shouldn't be that hard. And it shouldn't be painful. You know, like so many people, they wind up with a lot of tension between their shoulders and it's, and they get sore and their shoulders hurt and their neck's sore. And that's because they're working too hard because they're not working with the information they need. So the key here to having your shoulders go back is actually has to do with these ribs and the ability to expand the upper part of the rib cage. Now you looked at the at the picture on the internet of the mm-hmm. rib cage. Yep. And we have 12 pairs of ribs. Okay. So those 12 pairs of ribs, the first six attached directly to the sternum. But there's a joint where the rib meets a piece of cartilage and a joint where that piece of cartilage meets the sternum and a joint where that rib meets the spine. So these joints, the rib cartilage 
joints, they don't move hugely, but they can move. So that means for each rib of the first six, you have three joints. For each pair of those first six ribs, you have six joints. That means for the first six ribs, you have 36 joints. And we treat it like one. Mm -hmm. So what we need to do in order to make shoulders back easy is not think about the shoulders because that, that shoulder girdle is only attached at the collarbone to the sternum. It has one place of attachment to the rest of the skeleton. And the rest of it is actually floating around and sitting on the rib cage if we put the rib cage in the right place. Which means that instead of thinking pull your shoulders back, what we need to do is have a sense of expansion in these upper ribs. And the direction of expansion is in such a way that the rib cage gets like a bigger cylinder as opposed to crunching that cylinder or like crunching a soda can. So when most people go to sit up or pull their shoulders back, they lift the chest in such a way that the sternum is aiming toward their collar on their shirt. Well, as you do that, you've hollowed your lower back. So now we're back to the first fix, your night flat in the lower back. Mm -hmm. If you try to sit up straight and put your shoulders back, you've hollowed. And so now you're defeating that one. So instead of that, And that's where, you know, when I get people with the back flat, a lot of times they feel really, really slumpy. But that's the second direction that the sternum can move is down. And then the third option is the one we're looking for for shoulders back, which is expanding the chest in such a way that the sternum moves forward up away from the flat lower back. It's as if there was a diagonal from the lower back through the chest forward up like an arrow so that the cylinder of the chest actually expands or increases in diameter. And this is something that takes a little time to figure out. It's not a huge thing, and if you put too much effort into it, you get stiff. But if you take one hand and put it on your lower back to keep that flat, and you take your other hand and you put it on your upper ribs, and you think about the distance between your two hands increasing so that the sternum is moving in a forward-up direction, you'll notice that the collarbones automatically widen and the shoulder blades get to slide down the back of the ribs. From that, if you slump, you're going to feel the the ribs push back and it rolls the shoulder blade up and forward. So now it's rounded our shoulders, kind of like when we're typing on a keyboard. Yep. Yep. But if we heave, yep, if we heave our chest back, we haven't really changed the position of these upper ribs. Mm -hmm. So that's where... You know, if you just think about like rotating your palms so they're facing the ceiling, that'll help widen the collarbones and then the expansion of the chest upward, you'll feel how the shoulder blades can slide down the back and settle. And that's really what we want them to do so that the arms aren't stiff and the contact is fine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it all kind of goes together. And again, this is something, if you have a friend that, you know, you can that doesn't mind if you put their hands on them. (laughs) I know that sounds weird, but that's what I do as a daily (laughs) job, right? Um, If you put one hand on the shoulder blade and the other hand on the collarbone, right? And you have them experiment, you'll be able to feel those ribs expand and come forward. And it's kind of like they fill out underneath the collarbone. And as that happens, you'll notice the shoulder blade slide down the back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. More homework for me, I think. The next thing, let go of your belly. Okay. So, you know, when I was a kid, there was no such thing as core. I don't know. How, I don't know how old you are. Yeah. But- yeah. Certainly something that's a lot more talked about now. Yes. Right. And everybody thinks we want to have a strong core. Mm. But really what we want is a coordinated movement, which means the whole body has to participate as opposed to just one part, make, like, being the be-all and end-all of everything. And my my illustration to that is if I took all the orchestras in the world and I put them together in one room, and then I only let the bass drums play, what was the point, right? Mm -hmm. When we think about how exquisite our nervous system is and and, and how we don't even have to think about what we do when we do an organized movement, it's because our nervous system is able to coordinate that movement in such an elegant way. It's like playing that gigantic orchestra. But when we say, oh, you guys have to just sit over there and not do anything because this one's going to do all the work, it's not well distributed. It's not shared. 
Mm. And so one of the things that we have to realize is, is that the more distributed we are in the effort, then the less one place has to do all the job. So that's the first thing, is that if we just simply focus on the core, on the abdomen area, what about the rest of us? And what happens to the hip joints? So in most cases, when people tighten their core, they're also tightening their hips because they're having to restrict that area. And that's not a good coordinated movement. In other words, if you've ever watched, like I used to watch the Tour de France all the time, and I loved watching them pedal up the hip, the mountain, right? They'd be yeah. going up the mountains and they'd have their shirt open and you'd see these bellies hanging out and you're like, OMG, the guy's got a belly. He's like as thick around as a <laughs> stick, but he's got a belly. Why is that? Because if he tensed there, he would be inefficient in his cycling and yes. he wouldn't get up the mountain. So that's the thing is we've gotten really kind of carried away on one idea instead of looking at, well, wait a second, how does this play with everybody else? And when we start to think about organized movement, coordinated movement, efficient movement, it has to be looking at how the entire body functions, not just one place that's supposed to do the work. Yeah. Now. The next thing about that is if you take the bowl, like we talked about in the first one, and you spill it forward, then you're going to have to do something to keep your guts from falling out. Well, guess what you have to do? You have to tighten your core because you've spilled the bowl, everything's falling out, and now you have to tense all these muscles to keep everything in. But there's a simpler way to solve that. That's just bring the bowl level so everything stays in. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to do all this work and you don't have to tense the hips in the process. So, you know, back in the 80s, and I, I watched it happen because, you know, I mean, I'm dating myself. But, um, you know, if you go on to um, Facebook and you look at equestrians back in the day, you, know, you look at the pictures, you can literally tell what decade things changed. And it was in the 80s. And in the 80s, we lost the idea of the military influence We lost the understanding of function. It became more amateurs and non-military people teaching riding. And so it became more about style instead of function. And so that's where we started to get the real extreme sit up straight, toes turned out, you know, I call it praying praying mantis and hunters, the hollow back, (laughs) the crest release. And then all of a sudden we started hearing about core. Because everybody was like pitching forward and hollowing. And so then we had to do something to like keep our weight off the forehand. Yep. But the problem is tightening the core doesn't take the weight off the forehand unless you bring the bowl back into balance. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So we're right back to that first one of keeping the bowl level. And then my next point about tightening the core is riding, again, is coordinated movement. Your abdomen will do its job at the right moment where it's needed if you are in good position and functioning well. Okay, I know that's a big statement, but it means that if we have to do all this tensing to stay on, it means maybe we need to rethink what we're doing in the first place. Maybe we need to figure out where our seat bones are, balance our pelvis, free up our hips, and then allow our bellies to be soft so our hips aren't restricted and let the abdomen work in a coordinated way with the rest of the body so that it's only activated in the moment that it's needed to the degree that it's needed instead of over tightening something and then trying to figure out how to absorb motion. So, you know, I mean, I find that once people understand that they have to have the alignment of the skeleton and they, and I just had a woman, I mean, she's a lovely lady. I just had her yesterday and I was like, let your belly go. And as soon as she did, her horse was like, oh, thank you. <laughs> so, yes. you know, <laughs> it was like, you know, I mean, honestly, and suddenly she's down in the saddle. She's not nervous. She's not insecure because she's not tensing herself out. Yes. So, you know, this is why you're not going to believe me until you do this on the horse. Mm-hmm. I mean, the mm-hmm. horse gets to vote. That's why I love the way I teach because, you know, it's not trying to please me. It's what does your horse tell you? And so the best thing you can do the the next time you ride is sit on your horse, find your seat bone pointing straight down, make sure your back's flat, think about where your hip joint is and that it's greasy, let your belly go, and let your horse tell you what he thinks of it. Mm -hmm. He'll he'll tell you, and then just tighten your tummy and see what happens. If you're an equestrian coach or a horse riding instructor, or even if you aspire to be one, have a look at the free video series for horse riding instructors on the Horse Chats website. Go there now. Have a look. 
horsechats.com. These 10 quick tips to improve your riding, they're about horse communication as well, I think. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 All right. Now, the next one's interesting because instead of telling people to look up, you've got trick your eyes to look up. What's the difference? You know, tell us a little bit more about that. So this is one of my favorite, latest things that I've come up with. (laughs) And, you know, (laughs) we know we're supposed to look up, right? I mean, that's not a question. Sure. We know we're supposed to look up. And we know that when we look down, we move our 10-pound head forward, and that puts more weight on the forehand. But, you know, we're visual, and we want to see what's going on. And so this one is where, um, and obviously, you know, we'd only do this on a safe horse in a safe environment. You wouldn't do this on a young horse or anything like that, or, you know, out in the bush. Um, you want to practice this when you're in a in a safe place. But if you take a pair of... of um, cheap glasses. Now I just went to the store and I got kids summer glasses that had clear lenses. Mm -hmm. I took tape and I taped off the top and the bottom and only left a slit in the middle. Well, that means that when you're riding, if you don't look through the slit, you're not going to see anything. And so when you look down, there's no value because that part of your field of vision has been blocked off. Yep. So I could say a thousand times, look up, look up, look up, but I can give somebody a pair of glasses and I don't have to say it anymore. <laughs> okay. Yes. <laughs> and you know, it so, yeah, it was so funny because when I came up with this, I've been using this for a while and then I was teaching a clinic down in Florida and the husband of the organizer is a baseball player. I mean, mm-hmm. he was pro, yeah. but he then went on to teach after he left the pros, he was, he was teaching sports and we were talking about this and he's like, oh Yeah. For basketball, we give the kids these glasses so they can't look down and they have to learn how to dribble the ball without looking at it. <sighs> so, you know, it's not a new idea. It's yeah. just an idea that we haven't thought about in writing yes. is that we tend to think we should just yell at somebody instead of just, you know, mm-hmm. taking away the value of looking down. And then, of course, you're going to have to look up. Yep. Yep. That's a, a very good idea, I think. And one that I think, you know, a lot of instructors will be going, or coaches, they'll be going, yes, yes, what a good idea. I think I'll follow that. Yeah, yeah, yeah I hope yeah. they all just do yeah, this. Yeah, sure. yeah, it's a simple one. Yep. Yep. All right, the next one, push the stick forward. Okay. So now we're getting into some connections to the arms and hands. Okay. And so, so many people, you know, you've been in that hollow place and it pulls your elbows back and so yep. you've been pulling, but now we've got your back flat, hip free, And we have to figure out now how to not pull the arm back. Mm -hmm. So it's really simple. You can just take a stick. It's about, you know, uh, I don't know how many centimeters, Mm -hmm. you know, wide enough that you can have your two hands about six inches apart and have some stick on either end. Right. (laughs) So I don't know. You'll have to figure out what that is in centimeters. Um, And then you, you know, you can practice this off the horse so you can get used to it. Find your seat bones, have your feet flat on the floor, free up your hip. Let your belly go, float your chest, and now holding the stick, if you want to think about, or a tea tray, but a tea tray is hard to do on a horse. (laughs) You think about that you want to press it forward a little, but you don't want to extend the elbow. So you want to think of pressing it forward. And if you think of pressing from the pinky side of your hand, not extending your pinky, but from the line of the pinky finger through the underline of the arm, it's going to take you up the back of your arm to your shoulder blade, and then you can think of it going right down to your seat. Mm-hmm. So if you think about coming from the underline of your arm, you can press the stick forward just that little bit, right, which is going to allow your horse to lengthen his neck and reach into the contact. And if you, you know, pull your shoulder back, you're going to feel how the stick's going to pop up, and if it was a tea tray, you'd spill all the stuff on your lap. And if you drop your chest down, you're going to spill everything on the floor. But if you find the sweet spot, your elbow is going to be hanging by your side. In other words, if you're sitting in a chair and it doesn't have arms on the chair, you can let your arm hang so it's hanging straight down and then just simply bend your elbow and take a hold of your stick and just think that you just want to press it forward just a couple centimeters, not a lot. But that gives you a sense of expansion and direction. So the hands are moving toward the horse as your back stays back. And it's that expansion that's going to allow the horses to come up more in the withers. Yep, and I'm writing more notes again here. <laughs> Just as you're talking. Yes, yes. Okay, the flat of the thigh on the saddle. What have you got to say about that? So when when I was a kid in the 60s, well, in the 60s, just before I really started riding a lot, the, the style was to have 
the thigh really on the horse and the lower leg away. And now we've gone to the opposite extreme where people ride with their knees turned out. And the problem with going to either extreme is we've missed the middle, the place where the hip is going to be the freest in function in the most easiest way that's going to help our horse. So if we tighten our butt, our thighs are going to turn out. They're going to externally rotate. And that's, you know, ballerinas, that's what they're really good at is turnout, right? And they have very strong hindquarters. But then that's going to block our seat from moving forward with our horse. So, you know, I always talk about the middle. If you're sitting in a chair and you turn your knees out, you're going to feel how your butt tightens. And then if you try to go forward with your seat, you wind up pretty much hollowing your lower back because you've blocked the movement in the hip. If you round the lower back and pinch the knee, now we've blocked in another way. So the knee pinching and the knees out block. But what we want is the thigh in basically a neutral position without any rotation. So knees rotating inward, coming inward, that's internal rotation. Knees going outward is external rotation. And in the middle is basically no rotation. Mm -hmm. And what that's going to do is allow the flat of our thigh to be on the horse. Now, if you actually look at the thigh bone, if you ever get a chance or, or I don't know if a cow's thigh bone is the same, probably not. Okay. But on a person, the thigh bone is round on the outside and actually concave on that inside, on that flat side. So when you align your thigh so that it has no rotation, then the flat of that thigh bone is on the saddle. And this is what all the old books used to talk about, having the flat of your thigh in the horse. Now, so many riders, when I get them there now, go, oh, I'm pinching with my knees. But honestly, mm. you aren't. You have okay. contact from the top of the thigh all the way down to the knee. And if you're not sure, then intentionally grip with the knees, let that go, turn the knees away a little bit, let that go, and just play with it till you can figure out where the middle is, where you have the contact from the top of the thigh all the way down. Now, the reason this is important is especially in rising trots. Because in rising trot, when we rise, if we push off the stirrup to rise, the leg goes away, and when we sit, it claps back against the horse. So every time we do rising trot, our leg goes away, and we sit and we kick, and away, and we kick, and away, and we kick, because we don't have a weight-bearing surface area to take the weight in the rise. If the knees are turned out, it's going to make it even worse. But if we have the flat of the thigh on the horse, the rising trot should simply be a weight transfer from seat to thigh and back to seat, meaning that as the horse pushes you up, you let the weight go onto the thigh, you catch the weight there, and then you let yourself back down in the saddle so that you are never falling and you're distributing your weight around the horse's rib cage instead of onto the stirrup. Now, why do I not on the stirrup and rising trot? Because Newton's third law. A Newton's third law says for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So the more pressure I put on the stirrup, the more pressure it's going to push back on me. But the problem isn't just that, and that can cause a lot of knee pain. But the problem is that the stirrup is a pendulum and it's attached at the stirrup bar. So when I put pressure on the stirrup itself, like standing in the stirrup for rising trot, mm -hmm. I'm putting a lot of pressure on the stirrup bar which is pushing the horses back down, and I want his back to come up. Mm -hmm. So it's so counterproductive to what I want the horse to do. I want him to lift his back as I rise, not drop it. And if I let the weight go onto my nice flat thigh on the horse, now I'm putting my weight around the rib cage instead of onto the stirrup bar, which is onto his back. So that gives him a chance to come up into my seat in rising trot rather than pushing his back down. If you're an equestrian coach or a horse riding instructor, or even if you aspire to be one, have a look at the free video series for horse riding instructors on the Horse Chats website. Go there now. Have a look. Horsechats.com. And then following on from there, it sort of seems fairly logical that you talk about freeing your ankles. Yeah. Yeah. Because now that you're not bracing on your stirrups, the ankles can actually do their job. And the ankles are supposed to be part of the shock absorbing system of hip, knee, and ankle. Those are your three primary shock absorbers. Mm -hmm. Your lower back is not designed to absorb shock. It really doesn't want to take a pounding. 
But if we brace against the stirrup and lock our ankles in what is typically done for heels down, now the force has to go somewhere. We got to absorb that movement somewhere. And we try to absorb it in our lower back, which is really not designed for that. A lot of people wind up with back pain because of it, right? Yeah. So if we have the the flat of the thigh on and the weight on the thigh, then the ankle can be part of that shock absorption system. And you have to realize that your ankle is your horse's hock and you want your horse's hock free so he can swing his hind leg underneath you. If you start locking your ankles and bracing against the stirrup, you're going to restrict him and the stifles in the hocks. Mm-hmm. You know, and there's a simple thing people can do to help. Like I have so many people tell me, oh, you know, my ankles are just stiff. They're just yep. that way. Yep. Well, you know, I find that so much of it has to do with the pressure we have against the stirrup. But if you want to work on ankle flexibility at home, you can either take a pool noodle. Do you know what a pool noodle is? Yes. It's like a foam. Yeah, a pool noodle or a soup can. And while you're watching TV, you can just sit there with your socks off and just, you know, roll the ankle forward and back and side to side on your Mm -hmm. pool noodle. Just free up your ankles, you know, really passively, simple thing to do. Yep, that makes sense. And now the last one you've got now, I always think if you can finish with a smile, that's good. But tell us a little bit about the smile. Oh, did we really? Oh, we got through them faster than I thought. Hey, look at that. (laughs) (laughs) But we've got to talk about your smile because it's one with a difference. Oh, yeah. Yeah. This is one of my favorites. So, okay. so when your knees are turned out, mm-hmm. you know, your the your buttocks gets tight, your bum gets tight. And so, um, you know, I this I coined this because of my little skeleton. Um I now Neville is now with me. Ned was my previous one, but he's now <laughs> retired because he because he lost a lower leg. Yeah. <laughs> Poor guy, <laughs> not easy living with me. Um, but if you turn the knees out and you look at his skeleton. The shape between what's called the greater trochanters, the bump on the side of your femur, and your your seat bones form a frown, right? They, it looks frowny. But when you are wide across the greater trochanters and the femurs are in that neutral position, it makes a smile. So especially in jumping, I tell my riders to have a smiley butt. And instead of a frowny butt. So if you if you take jumping position and you tense your butt and your knees go out, you have to fold at your waist instead of at your hips. And um, that, things can kind of go south from there. But if you think about smiley butt, you think of like a nice big grin across the back of your bum. That lets the, the thigh come on, the flat of the thigh, wide the back of the hip, and um, puts the weight on the thigh. And so it's an easy one to remember, smiley butt. <laughs> I visual really helps with that one. I don't know that it comes across. It's, visual, but it's in my book. I have smiley button my jumping book. <laughs> okay, okay. You've given us these points and they're just great. You know, as I said, that the depth, the knowledge that you bring in, I've had to go again, you know, I've had to go again to look at the thigh bone and, and go back to Google and, and I certainly will be listening to this again and again. And, you know, and both... They're funny because they're, they're exercises you can do off the horse, but they're, it's also something that you do on the horse. You know, like I could, yeah. I can imagine either either you know going and doing your shopping or something and listening to this podcast, but also riding and listening to it and going through the steps as you ride. Yeah, and I have a lot of people doing strange things in grocery stores. I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, pretending the to look at something. Yeah. Riding, it's yes, like, uh... yes, do a couple of exercises down the aisle. Yeah. Yeah. Wendy, yeah, 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 you're off to Equitana now. I so, am. So um, I'm just thinking about people contacting you. If they want to contact you at Equitana, what's the best way? Um, probably the best way is to email me at wendy at wendymurdoch.com. Okay, yep, yep. Um, and, Or on Facebook. You know, Murdoch Method on Facebook is mm-hmm. the best way. And um, I'll be there. I'll be posting stuff from Equitana on my Instagram account, Murdoch Method, and on my Facebook page, Murdoch Method. And um, it's if you have never been, this is the most amazing show. It's I always think of it as a cross between Cirque du Soleil and Disneyland. <laughs> like it's but it's, with horses, <laughs> with horses, so much better than those, but with horses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's nine days of nonstop horses from ten o'clock in the morning till six o'clock at night. You can, there's there's ninety thousand square meters of floor space. There's I, I don't know how many buildings and um. There's two arenas in just about every building that are doing demonstrations, whether it's breed demonstrations or rock demonstrations or all kinds of things. And then in their main arena, 
they have a huge arena and they have this wall, which is all LED lights, and they project these amazing pictures and scenes and, and everything up on the screen. And then they have like one of my favorites was it was a dozen Shetland ponies in carts, and the girls had these fluffy blue skirts on with balloons off the back of their head, and they did, you know, drill drill driving and they they have fire and they have jumping demos. I mean, it's like it's like nothing you've you know ever seen and it's just um, i don't speak german so i don't understand most of it but <laughs> you don't need to because the visuals are so incredible mm-hmm. and the shopping mm-hmm. is yeah. amazing yeah, yeah. <laughs> like i have to keep my credit card at home yes <laughs> okay i've uh, you know i've been to the one in the southern hemisphere with a couple of different venues and just it is it's amazing here but i have heard that you know it's a longer bigger show in the northern hemisphere so i certainly will have to get across there and, um, you know, so I can experience both and give you a bit of a comparison because you've only been to the ones in the Northern Hemisphere. I've only been to the ones in the Southern right. Hemisphere. So we'll have to, um, we'll have to, you'll have to come to the one in the South. I'll have to go to the one in North and we'll have to have a comparison. Awesome. <laughs> That's All a right. great idea. Yeah, because yeah, I'm planning on coming down under in October. I'm, I'm hoping to get to both New Zealand and Australia. Uh, I'll be doing Surefoot stuff when mm-hmm. I come down. Good, and, good. Um, yeah, okay. so I'm excited to get. I haven't been there in a long time. Well, you'll have to talk to us before then, Wendy, so we can and and have all your details with you of dates and venues and everything else, so oh, we great. can, um, you know, put yeah, it so on. I'm and still setting people, all that up. Yeah, if people want to contact you, they'll be able to get in and, and meet you personally, which would be very good. So lovely to talk to you. Yeah, be a blast. And talk yeah. to you, yeah, soon so <laughs> before October. Okay, okay, thanks, thanks, Wendy. All right, bye. If you've enjoyed this chat, then please comment, rate and subscribe. If you'd like any changes or recommendations for guests, then please contact us through horsechats.com. And while you're online, have a look at the government accredited courses at internationalhorsecollege.com. Registered Training Organisation 31352. Remember that our comments and instructions are general in nature and do not take into consideration your individual horses, or your individual ability and circumstances. If you enjoyed this podcast, then please leave your comment below.